Hey everyone, happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining me today on this edition of Water, Wind, Wine Ministries video. Today we're going to be discussing lukewarm Christianity, which isn't really a thing. As I said in the introduction, we're going to be discussing lukewarm Christianity, or what most people believe to be lukewarm Christianity. I'm sure that you've heard, like I have, this sermon on whether you're lukewarm or not, and that Jesus wants you to be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. And I'm sure lots of preachers um, have been in your ear, like they've been in mine, about being on fire for God, and not being cold, and not being lukewarm. And so we're going to discuss where that comes from. In particular, that comes from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And to understand what our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about, we're going to have to understand Laodicea as a city and the assembly at Laodicea. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. If not, just read on the screen and uh, we'll be right back with you. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have no need of anything, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and is op and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we just read this pretty expansive passage in Revelation, and you're probably wondering, A, why am I talking about Revelation, and B, what in the world does it have to do with you? Actually, this is a huge passage. Um, and I said just a second ago that there's really no such thing as a lukewarm Christian, and that's true. This is not talking about Christians. I know that you think it is because it says to the angel of the church um, of the Laodiceans, right. Well, what you need to understand is is some things about Laodicea. Number one, I want to point out to you that Jesus Christ said to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. He did not say that to the other churches. In chapters 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, you find over and over, actually seven times, Jesus is saying to the angel of the church at such and such a place, with the exception of the Laodiceans, which is the last one, and the first one, which is Ephesus. And he says, um, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. So it's different in its construction than angel of the church of the Laodiceans. The church of Ephesus is a church of a city. The church of the Laodiceans is a church of people. And so that, that's different because the church at Laodicea really wasn't a Christian church. It was a church, an assembly. The word church actually in the Greek means the means assembly. So it, it wasn't church like we think of a church. We only promulgate that to a Christian church, but this is not what this was. And that's where people get confused. The church at Laodicea was not a Christian church. How do we know that? Well, there are a couple of reasons I know that. Number one, the, the text bears it out. Jesus Christ, he said, said himself that they're blind and they're deceived and he doesn't tell them any good works that they've done, um, that they've worked for the name of his father or anything like that, like he did with the other churches. That's number one. Number two, he says, behold, I stand at the door knocking. 
Um, and if anybody will hear the voice, my voice and open to me, I will come in and will, I will dine with him. And then we find that it is in the communion that we have with God, the common union that we have with God, that we have a relationship with him. So it's very evident from just the scripture that the church at Laodicea was not Christian. Furthermore, um, there was a group of Laodicean leaders that decided they were going to um, tell their congregation at the church at Laodicea or of Laodicea to how to act. And basically what they did was they sat down and they wrote 60 canons. Now, the Bible is 66 books or 66 canons, 66 different texts telling the story of Jesus Christ throughout. And you know, but these people at Laodicea, they're called the Council of Laodicea, they sat down and wrote 60 canons to regulate how their congregation acted. Now, the Bible says that if you add anything or take anything away from the Word of God, you can't stand on it and you'll be found a liar. So you actually are um, prompted not to do that, commanded, as it were, not to add anything or take anything away from the Word of God. And so um, this is what the this church at Laodicea did actually, they added to, to what they thought they needed to add to the scriptures. And they were everything from, you know, sexually moral laws to finance, to dress, to just every, every aspect of life that they could control. They, they did control it. And they, there was no need for them to do that because we have it right here. And not only that, and they had everything, they didn't have the new Testament, of course, but they had the old Testament. And then God said that he would write his word on their hearts. So there was no need for them to do this. There was no need. I mean, if God can't regulate the morality of his people, then is he really in relationship with his people? So let's talk about Laodicea as a city. And then I'm going to relate it back to how our church and our world is today. Laodicea was a city that sat in a valley um, quite a distance from any water source. Um, it was on the trail from the west to the east. So people were leaving Ephesus and coming to the east and Laodicea was a natural stopping point. Um, it was pretty far from water. The closest water was a river called the Meander River and it was quite a distance from Laodicea. But what the Laodicean people did is they created an aqueduct system to harvest water from the Meander River and the aqueduct system was not made from stone. It was actually made from hardened clay. And where the Meander River came into the aqueduct system of the Laodiceans was like a waterfall. And so it was pretty jagged rocks and this and that. So there was quite a substantial force of the water coming over this waterfall and into the aqueduct structure of the Laodiceans. And so what would happen is this water would come down through this clay, hardened clay, not fire hardened, just hardened by the sun, clay aqueduct system. And because of the force of the water and the construct of the aqueduct system, parts of the sediment that were in the clay would get into the water, of course. And so what the Laodiceans did was they used this water as um, kind of like Pepto-Bismol, but a little bit more harsh, like Ipecac kind of. So what it would do is they would, if they had a stomach ache or if they'd eaten something poisonous or whatever, they would consume this lukewarm water and it would make them vomit. And so Jesus is actually using their own system to speak to them. And that's what God does. He uses your own life to speak to you and to illustrate truths about him, about the kingdom, about life in general that you can understand, that you can comprehend. So this meant something to the Laodiceans. What it does not mean to the Laodiceans and what it did not mean to us or excuse me, does not mean to us as Christians is it doesn't this isn't referring to Christians that have just kind of lost their luster and they're lukewarm and he wishes that they were cold or hot, but they're Christians. Um, anyway, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is he's saying, okay, I want you to be a Christian and I want you to either be a refreshing Christian or I want you to be an on fire Christian. Now I personally, my, my personality is I'm an on fire Christian. If you, if you knew me personally, if you ask anybody who's around me, even people who don't know me personally, people I see on the street, like Seriously, everybody, I talk to them about Jesus all the time. Like, for instance, I bought a pair of snowboard pants a couple weeks ago because all of my snowboard gear had been stolen. And so I went on Facebook and went on Marketplace and bought these snowboard pants. 
I'm getting to a point. Okay, I promise I'm not just telling you this story. And anyway, so I went and met this woman and we were talking about the snowboard pants and all this and, and how, and I just, out of nowhere, I say to this woman, now I had Facebook stalked her before to like know who, what kind of a person she was. And I knew that she didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because she had all kinds of witchy, weird, you know, stuff on her, on her page. And I could discern that she was not of the body of Christ anyway. So I went to talk to her and I said to her, you know, all my stuff got stolen and, and she's like, oh my gosh, how did you deal with it? And I told her, I said, well, um, you know, I was walking, I already forgave the people. I chose to forgive them in the name of Jesus right when it happened, but I did find my flesh. Everybody that I would see with a snowboard bag or a snowboard or whatever, I was checking out all their stuff to see if they had my stuff that they stole. And so I was like hyper suspicious. And so I went to God about it and, and actually went to one of my pastors about it. And he told me, you know, to go ahead and release them from what they stole, but ask God that he not he doesn't have to restore that stuff to me but i want their souls for that i want their souls to be brought into the kingdom because of what they stole from me in other words whatever they stole from me will lead them somehow into the kingdom of god and so i told this to this woman who's definitely a pagan and and so then she pops off with something about karma being meaner than she is and all this and it's just interesting to me because everywhere I go, I'm on fire for God. Like I'm talking about God all the time. Like somebody comes, comes around me and they're sick. I'm like, I can lay hands on you. God will take care of that. And you would be amazed at how many people refuse that. It's actually astounding and disgusting. But anyway, so there's that kind of Christian, which is what I am. And then there's another kind of Christian, which I'm, I may become later in life. Um, maybe I just seen it with a lot of older people. Um, they tend to be more the cold Christian, not that they're cold hearted, that they're cold refreshing. Like, have you ever been out on a hot day and you just wanted cold water and you just drink cold water and it's just so refreshing to you? Or sometimes I get really hot when I sleep at night and I really want cold water and it's very refreshing. And that's the kind of Christian that Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about refreshing Christians. You know, I've had ministry teams where I've gone in and prayed for people and then I've had other members of those ministry, of the same ministry team, um, minister compassion in the form of, you know, just sitting with somebody and loving on somebody and just bringing them that kind of comfort <clears throat> that, that they're called to do. Um, and that to me is a cold, refreshing kind of a Christian. Also a, a refreshing kind of a Christian can be a Christian who's not weird, you know, cause so many times I see Christians on TV that are just freakazoids. They're, they dress funny. They, I don't know, they put too much makeup. I don't even know. I mean, I love them, but they need to do something with their something. Anyway, so I, that to me isn't refreshing, but finding a Christian that's been through what I've been through and they're really normal, um, that's really refreshing to me. So this is what Jesus Christ is saying. He's not saying, I don't want you to be lukewarm Christians. Of course, he, he's, I mean, he doesn't want you to be complacent. That's called complacency. And, um, that is actually unbelief and you're not walking in what God told you to walk in. You're not walking in his word when you act like that. So that's not really a lukewarm Christian. It's because the, the, the quality, the type of Christian you are has been given to you by God. Like whether your ministry is on fire and you're just going to light everybody up or whether it's to comfort everybody and to, you know, to be a refreshing to them. So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people who make him want to puke. And why do they make him want to puke? Well, as I mentioned earlier, they have this canon that they've, that they've written and what they're presenting to the world is that they are a church and that they are presenting God and they're not, they don't really even have a relationship with God. They're not even saved. And it, and it makes Jesus sick. It makes him want to puke. And, and that's just a really profound way to look at this. And that's exactly what we see in this culture today. I can be around other people who, um, at the onset, they might say that they're Christians. I ran into this a lot where we used to live that people would say that they were Christians and you would, um, for instance, mention a particular political event that was happening and they would go off and be completely to the other side against the Bible. And when they were approached, they would just be completely unreasonable, irrational, and have no relationship. That that person to me is not a Christian, but because they're so um, well received in the world and they're so financially stable, 
the world does receive them. And so we're going to talk about that financial stability here in just a second when we get to the second half of this passage. But just understand that Jesus Christ is not talking to a church that is of his body. He's talking to the church of the Laodiceans. He says it that way because they made their own church. They didn't consult him. They didn't come to him. The heck, they're not even saved, right? And so so he's upset and he and but he loves them. He says, "Whom I love, I rebuke." And he's he he loves them. And so he's like, "Hey, you better get your stuff together because you're not even actually saved. So you need to get it together and you need to answer this call." And so what I would say to you, if you're watching this and right now ministering to you, the Bible says that Jesus was standing at their door of their heart knocking. And if anybody opens to him, he will come in and he will um, dine with him. And if you are watching this and your heart is pounding a lot right now, it's because you're not saved. That is actually the sound of the Lord Jesus Christ knocking at your heart, telling you you need to get saved. And that doesn't have to be a big, huge thing. I mean, the guy on the cross said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, done, basically. So it doesn't have to be this huge thing. All you do is believe that Jesus Christ came from the Father, became sin for you, died, and was resurrected again the third day. You believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth and say, Lord, save me. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And it's done. It's over with. Okay. So, um, so there's that. So let's talk about this money issue. Now I'm not against money. I, God is not against money. You have to have money to make um, Bibles. You have to have money to bless people. You have to have money to live. God is not against money. In Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the cursing chapter, he says, you will lend and you will not borrow. And it's a blessing to be able to lend money. Well, if you, if he's against money, how do you lend money? If he's against, he, he, it doesn't, it doesn't square. It doesn't make any sense. So he's not against money. What he's, he's against is money having the people to where some money and the things that you own mean more to you than doing what's right. And, um, you know, the second most misquoted verse in the Bible is actually the love of money is the root of all evil. I've heard Christians and non-Christians quote this verse incorrectly saying that money is the root of all evil, which is absolutely a terrible thing to say because then it gets you to do all kinds of crazy stuff with your money that I'm not going to get into. But that is not what my stance is. I'm not against money. I'm not against Christians having money. I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm against money having Christians. But let's talk about Laodicea as a city so that we can properly understand this. Now, Laodicea, like I said, sat in a valley and it was on this major thoroughfare, thoroughfare from Ephesus to the east. And because there were so many people from so many different nations coming, there were a lot of banking institutions and trade establishments in Laodicea. They were a very, very wealthy society. Not only that, but they produced textiles, clothing, um, more than anybody else in the region. And in fact, they produced black wool, which was um, rare. And basically, one of the only places you could find it was in Laodicea. Furthermore, they actually had a medical school in Laodicea. And this medical school um, produced two very, very famous medicines. One was an ear salve and one was an eye salve. The, um, they were both basically supposed to do the same thing. They were supposed to clear up the hearing um, so that you could always hear. You wouldn't go deaf when you aged or if you were deaf, you know, you could put it in there and it would give you your hearing back. Same with the I salve that you could see more clearly, that you could um, get rid of stigmatisms and, and not be blind in your older age or, you know, at all. So this is what they produced and they made a lot of money in Laodicea because of it. What is so interesting is that our Lord Jesus Christ says, he who has ear an ear to hear. And he says, put on eye salve so that you can see that you are blind and naked and wretched because they thought they had it all together. They had their money taken care of, they had their health taken care of, they had church taken care of. So in their minds, they had it going on, right? How many how many people do you know or you yourself are in the body of Christ that you just think you got it because you've never really experienced anything bad. You just, you, you got it, right? Well, do you have it? You'll know. Because right now when I'm talking, your heart's going to start pounding. The Holy Ghost is going to start ministering to your heart and waking you up, shaking you up on the inside if what I'm saying applies to you. If it doesn't, then you just keep it and you just learn something today. But these people at Laodicea, you know, they were famous for their eye salve that was supposed to give clear vision. This, When I read this and when I understood this, it really meant a lot to me because I grew up in a in a church body that was preaching unbalanced prosperity. In other words, God's want, God wants you to be balanced in your prosperity. He wants you to prosper in your spirit, your soul, your body, 
your family socially and monetarily. And these people were hyper focused on the monetary prosperity. And at, I was a really young Christian. And in fact, I don't even know that I was saved, honestly, because of the way that I treated God, of the way I treated other people, of the way I thought about things and did things. I can't, I can't tell you with an honest heart that I was saved when I was younger. And one of the things I did actually because of this prosperity gospel that was just entrenched in my mind, I would give tithes to a church and then I would write down, you know, what I gave in tithes and I would expect a hundredfold and I would, and I would, you know, claim it and God, you have to do this. You have to, you have to, you have to, and, and just really controlling of God as it were. And so I didn't have a proper relationship of submission to the Lord and I didn't have a proper relationship with money and I didn't have a proper relationship with anybody else. And so it's like God couldn't get through to me. So I don't think I was saved. But anyway, a few years later, I, I really felt the call of the Lord on my life just hard and just, and just really stirring me up. And at that moment, I, I said to the Lord, you know what, you can have it. You can have me. You can have everything. I, I was so in the mood to humble myself before the Lord that I, you know, gave him my snowboard and I gave him my, my horses and I gave him my trucks and my everything that I owned, I gave it to him. And so I had a dream right after that, or, you know, some, some days after that about these, these angels that were in this town square and they were recruiting members of God's army. And I remember in the dream, I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 and I had my dad by the hand. I'm not sure what significance that holds in the dream, but anyways, I had my dad and I wanted to go be recruited by these angels. So I go down to the town square and there's, there's one angel sit, standing on the side of this, like a fold up table and then another angel sitting behind it. And the angel sitting behind it, I said to him, I said, I really want to be in God's army. I really want to do this. And he said, okay, but you're not ready. You're not mature enough. And I said, well, what do I do? How do I get mature? And he directed me to the angel that was standing next to him. And this angel in my dream, this is before I knew anything about Revelation 3, I see this angel grab this canister of salve and he takes it and he and he puts it on my eyes. I even wrote it in my dream book. It's really profound. He takes this salve and he puts it on my eyes, right? You know, just goops it on my eyes, but I could still open my eyes and I do. And I can see so clearly and so vibrantly. It was kind of like those, those yellow glasses, you know, that you put on and everything looks real fine and detail and loud and bright and you know you know what I'm talking about and that's how it was in this dream and so right when I woke up after that I started looking at scripture and I could see things that I couldn't see before that's when my mental ability to understand scripture really came was that was after that dream and so that's what Jesus Christ is saying to the Laodiceans he's saying that you need to have not the stupid eye salve that you sell from your medical school you need to have my eye salve you need to have the stuff that I can give you and what he was telling them when he told them to buy from him you know gold and white garments is he saying you know you're fine that you have money but you need to give the money to the kingdom you know part of the money to the kingdom and you need to come you need to give me everything you know you need to just hand it over and that basically when you lay down your life at, at Christ's feet and you say you be my Lord you're basically buying him not really but kind of if you I hope you can understand this you're, you're saying I'm giving you my whole life and because you do that he gives you his life and he gives you you know righteousness and a new name and all this and so that's what he's telling the church at Laodicea he says your money ain't gonna save you Money does not do anything in the day of wrath. He says, your intellect is not going to save you because I send things, base things of the world to confound the wise. He said, and your eye salve is not going to make you see. You can only see when I live inside you and when you are humbled to me, showing you the world, how it is and how it should be. And that's what he's saying. So what I want to say to you now is that if, if you think that you're a Christian, but you have a little bit of a doubt because of the way that you act and that you're not producing fruit and you, you don't understand the Bible and you, and you don't really want to do things God's way, then I would challenge you to, to search your heart and see if you really have had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And only you and God know that, especially if your heart's pounding right now, I would I would encourage you to get saved because it's a pretty sure sign that you're not. All right, guys. Well, hit me up on our ministry page on Facebook, WWW Ministries. You can hit me up on Instagram, Water, Wind, Wine Ministries. And of course, I want you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here where you're watching this video. If you have any questions, you can reach me on Facebook or Insta. Remember that I love you and that Jesus loves you.